Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, although I have to say that 30 under 30 thing was quite some time ago. Um, and, and thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to uh, speak today. So as I look out, I see some familiar faces, but a, a lot of people um, new to me. So I'm going to sort of quickly just tell you who we are um, at NAPSIS. Um, so we have 38 employees. We're located in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and these are some of the senior folks um, at the company. And rather than sort of walking through who they are, here is the, um, the word cloud of where we've come from. And you can see sort of a combination of academia, life science tools companies, and the semiconductor industry. So I'm going to start with something that seemingly has very little to do with personalized medicine. Uh, who caused the financial crisis? And if you look around the financial press, you'll find some really interesting theories on this topic, um, like this one, the economic impact of the genomic revolution's failure, uh, the most significant economic event of the past decade, human genome project failure. Uh, and these are not photoshopped. These are, these are real, actual articles. Um, and this one is my favorite. Did the failure of genomics doom the US economy? And so the question is, what is going on here? Um, you know, so I, I think it's that, on the one hand, a lot has been accomplished in genetics and genomics over the past decade. But it hasn't had the type of effect on most people's lives that the lay and financial press promised that it would. Um, at least not yet. And you might think of the situation now kind of this way. So on the one hand, we're getting a lot more sequence data than we were certainly a decade ago by an amazing margin. And it's all fed into this algorithmic slash computational slash informatic black box. But then relatively a relatively modest amount of increased new biology has been coming out the other side. And as of late, a lot of people have been blaming the black box, um, blaming the guys in the black box. And so the question is, is that fair? Is that appropriate? Um, so this is a picture of Providence. This is the um, neighborhood that Napsis is in. And this is the festival of water fire. Um, I'm excited because I'm on the board of Water Fire, and just a couple days ago, it was named as one of the top nighttime activities in the entire world. Uh, I assume they mean public nighttime activities. Um, and, and the buildings on the right are the Rhode Island School of Design, uh, also known as RISD. So you have a lot of these art students walking around taking artistic pictures of architecture. And let's imagine that they're so artistic that on average, they're the size of only a single brick. And that because they're art students, they don't really want to kind of bother to write down where they took each of these pictures. So we leave it to the guys in the black box to take billions of such single brick photos and try to assemble a cityscape from that. Uh, and this is quantitatively the problem that these guys face trying to do de novo assembly using SBS data and trying to assemble a human genome. Uh, so what they typically do is they use a reference. So in, in the analogy here, this is the, these are San Francisco contigs assembled onto the Boston reference. And this is also quantitatively what this looks like when it happens. Um, but you know, it's actually a pretty good reference. Both cities are pretty similar. They have a lot of biotechnology, Obviously, Boston has a much better football team. <laughs> too soon, too soon. Um, and and the, the problem with this approach, <laughs> the problem with this approach is that it doesn't do a very good job at all of characterizing large-scale genomic variation, large length-scale genomic variation. And this is problematic because we know that genomic variation is important across all nine orders of magnitude of genomic length scale. Everything from SNPs to aneuploidies are important. And by largely ignoring significant portions of the spectrum, we are not really getting the whole picture. And you might say that the reason that we're in this situation 
is that this has typically been the sort of central dogma of how to build a sequencing technology or how to build a sequencing technology company. Step one is you find the technology. So you find an interesting chemistry or an interesting detection technology. You scale it up and you hand the data off to the guys in the black box and ask them what they can give you back. Um, and I think, I think that might be why we're sort of in the situation we're in now. At Napsys, what we've done is this. We basically said, if we want to be able to answer all clinically relevant questions related to the genome, and we want to be able to do this without a supercomputer and get the right answer, what kind of information content does the raw data have to have? And then once we know that, let's go about figuring out what technology will build that, will we'll create that kind of data. And so what we've come up with is something that we're calling positional sequencing. Um, positional sequencing is different in some ways from other ways of thinking about sequencing because it gives you information about both what the sequence is as well as where it is. And the way it does this is it uses solid state nano detection to find the locations of probes hybridized to very long, and by very long we mean tens to hundreds of KB fragments of DNA. And this allows for the analysis of genomic variation on any length scale, everything from SNPs to aneuploidies, translocations, et cetera. Um, these detectors are completely solid state, completely compatible with standard semiconductor fabrication technology. And something else that's interesting here is this technology is inherently targeted. So whatever probes you put in here, those are the answers you get back. And those are the only answers you get back. That said, it can be used to target everything, in other words, to do de novo whole genome sequencing. So this is a, um, a slide that our new chief commercial officer, Stan Rose, put together. Um, I think it's meant to convince you that this is a better way of looking at DNA than other ways of looking at DNA. Um, so here we're comparing NABSYS positional sequencing to sequencing by synthesis, direct nanopore sequencing, and PCR. So the, again, the fact that you have both sequence identity and sequence location directly measured allows this to be highly accurate. Um, the targeted nature when you want it to be, is, it can be very useful. The long range sequence information um, is helpful. And then let me, let me skip down to data burden or computational burden. Um, there's sort of a few ways in which this helps the guys in the black box and helps the computational problem. The, the first and sort of most straightforward is the fact that it's non-optical, so there are no image files. Uh, more to the point, the, infecti the effective information content of each of these reads is much higher, which means that you can figure out how to put them together with much less computational power. And then finally, in targeted mode, where you've only put in a finite number of probes looking for a finite number of um, potential sources of variation, it further decreases the problem. Um, the workflow here is, is pretty straightforward. Um, you extract DNA, you hybridize probes, you put in a reagent mix that is responsible for getting rid of things like secondary structure and for protecting long fragments of DNA. Uh, you load the sample and the DNA is read electronically. And because we're using electronic detection in this way, uh, the DNA is, can go through at one million bases per second per detector. And you can have many detectors per chip, many chips per instrument. Um, so we don't use optical detection, but here's an example of a detector where we've put a glass slide over the top so you can kind of watch what's going through. These are 20 KB molecules going through. Um, and then this is one second of electrical data. If you slow this down by a factor of 100, you can see individual molecules in which probes have been hybridized. And here's an example of doing this on uh, the M13 genome. And I like this slide because it, is, it might be the way in which you look at a clinical sample in which you're looking for both large scale variation and small scale variation. So what these guys have done um, is 
find the locations of eight probes on the M13 genome, as well as targeted, in, in a targeted manner, resequence two small regions. And so what's key here is not only is the sequence accurate, but the location of that sequence is also accurate. Uh, so this is an example of, again, single molecule solid state electronic uh, sequencing. So um, I, will, I will conclude here with, with these comments. One, while there have been really, really impressive advancements in sequencing technology, they're not really sufficient in our view to deal with the genomic portion of the personalized medicine problem. And it's really not primarily the fault of the guys in the black box. Um, the time has come to go beyond questions of cost per base and throughput and start thinking about things like information content, accuracy, data burden, and clinical utility. And we develop positional sequencing with all of these metrics in mind with this sort of algorithms first approach. And again, whatever questions the researcher has or ultimately the clinician has, they can um, ask only those questions, and those are the only answers they get back. So thank you uh, for your attention.